a kid growing up in Northern California, I remember going to a sleepover at a friend's house whose parents were more permissive than my Chinese immigrant strict parents. And I was shocked by this guy named George Carlin talking about the five words that you can't say on television. And then I later heard a tape of Lenny Bruce, his mentor, talking about seven words you really couldn't say and I think he was arrested for. And during all this time, this it was kind of totally shocking to me. And then my more tame friends' houses, we would listen to like tame comedians like uh, Bill Cosby. And, um, and maybe the intermediate ones were the SNL not ready for time prime players. But I, I will say that I don't need to say the words that Carlin or Bruce said, because there are actually more shocking words. Right? The, the words that really rock my world as a doctor and as a surgeon and as a parent and a family member and as a teacher they all start with C, actually. So these are the words, cancer, containment, and cure. So let's talk about cancer. So cancer, back in the day, even in my grandparents' day and my parents' day, and even sometimes now, it's kind of like a dirty secret. It's the thing that you don't want to say the name or it might get out, right? So it, it's almost like it's a shame or a stain or this contagious. Um, it, it's, uh, how many people do we read in the obits that they died of a, after a lengthy illness or et, et cetera, et cetera? Something, something hidden about it. Henrietta Lacks, whose cells have changed and changed the world, couldn't even really tell her family, her little children and her, even her husband, about her cancer. This is, falls on a series of different kind of plagues, right? So there's the bubonic plague, these are scenes from the Decameron. Consumption, the name for TB, where people would just wither away. And consider the AIDS epidemic, the AIDS epidemic where people could not say its name, right? I was a medical student in San Francisco in the early 90s, late 80s or early 90s, and this was a, a plague, something that people were ashamed of. Well, you can say cancers come out of the closet, right? So those of us can lobby on Capitol Hill for funding to be increased for diseases like pancreatic cancer, Patients, I had the privilege and the sort of embarrassment of serving as a model on the runway for the Catwalk for Cancer Care here at Boston Medical Center, which raises funds for support for patients with, with cancer. But that being said, before that triumphant moment for those survivors, when a patient is facing a cancer diagnosis or they think they might have cancer or a loved one might have cancer, I'll, I'll tell you what I see, right? It is, it is a terrifying, awful moment. People are left they're stripped away, they're left staring into the abyss, right? They are so helpless, and I, I have to say, I, I'm often there at that time. Sometimes I'm the one that gives them the bad news because the biopsy result, the x-ray, the test result has back, and they're in my office, and I'm there, and they're all alone. But then, then you know what happens? I actually get to see this magic happen, start to happen. What happens when you get a cancer diagnosis is that everything that seemed so important in your life, the daily struggles, falls away. Something that seems so important, whether it's money or politics or your nutty relatives or fighting at, at holidays, all this stuff falls away. And what you're left with is what's at your real, your real core, right? What's important to you? Who is important to you? What are your values? What's your faith? What good do you want to do, and, and what do you want to leave your loved ones with, right? And to be there at that moment is such a privilege, right? To be there with people when they're reevaluating their whole lives. So I was a resident uh, with someone named Sid Mukherjee. We overlapped in residency training across town, and I won't pretend we had any interactions other than just normal medical surgical consults, nor that we would even remember the interaction, but he wrote an amazing book called The Emperor of All Maladies, an autobiography of cancer that won the Pulitzer Prize. He was a Ted Prize winner. Um, and, and I will say that I read an interview with him afterwards where he said an oncologist or oncology is the most dismal of sciences and yet the most hopeful, right? So... I get to see these patients that are really reevaluating their lives and figuring out what is really at its center. The second word I want to talk to you about is containment. So if you have a self and your values, and then you have a cancer diagnosis, it comes crashing into your life. This is what I want to tell people. This is my visual. I tell my patients, this cancer is this green, evil monster that's running around in your life. And it seems like it's upsetting your whole orderly house, your values, your family, your relationships. It's a mess. Everything you do, whether it's dropping your kids off at school or, or anything, preparing food, it, it, the cancer seems to permeate it, change it, destroy it. Our job as a 
care team, as your, your providers, is to be able to help you take that little monster and put him in a box and lock it up and stick it on a shelf in your life, right, in your house, so that you have to take it down sometimes. You have to deal with it, right? You have to open the box and you have to feed it or do whatever you need to do. You have to get chemo or you have to get your surgery or you go to your appointments. It's necessary, but only when it's necessary. Our job is to help you contain that cancer, contain the treatment of that cancer, so it's, you have control over it. So again, cancer disrupts someone's life. It seems bigger than life. Immediately after the cancer diagnosis, it, it engulfs one's life. But our job is to help our patients understand with a multidisciplinary team how they can control it. So it doesn't overlap all of themselves, all of their values. The third word is cure. Patients have questions, right? Once they get over the initial shock, they, 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 they want to say, Doc, how long do I have to live? That's the first question, right? And the second question is, can I be cured of this? Right? These, are, these are hard questions. I'm going to go and digress. Right? This is two C words that have nothing to do with what I'm going to say today are Catholic and confession, but I'm going to digress anyway. Most of you don't know, I was baptized in a somewhat urgent fashion right before I got married at, at 30. Right? So you know the great thing about being baptized at 30? It's like everything you did before 30 is gone. Poof! <laughs> right? It's, it's, it, it's, you're cured. You're cured of sin. You are so holy. It's great. Be that as it may, we want to cure people, right? We're doctors. We want to cure people. Patients want to be cured. It's natural. Of those two questions that the patients ask me, how long do I have to live? I cannot tell you that how many people have come to me and said, doc, this other doctor said I had six months to live, and he was wrong. He lied. Well, he did, right? Because if he or she told you exactly how long you had to live, of course it's a lie. Statistics are all lies, right? Because they're averages. No one is a statistic. You're not a statistic. I'm not a statistic. David Ortiz, when he was batting, was not going to bat his batting average every time he came to the plate. He was never going to bat his batting average. Statistics are lies. They're medians or means. They're averages. And there's tails on the both sides. Outliers. Our job is to get you to the good side of the outliers as long as you have a reasonable quality and quantity of life, right? It's quality of life, not just quantity of life. So you're not a statistic no matter what. And then the question about cure. Now, cure is hard, right? Cure is hard. Some cancers are totally curable. Some are not. Life is incurable. But some cancers, like pancreatic cancer, which I treat, most people will eventually succumb to the disease. But again, they're not a statistic. Our job is to get them further and further down the outlier curve, and more treatments will come. So I, I treat it on a day-to-day -day basis. I have patients with pancreatic cancer that I resected now 10 or 15 years ago that now have to deal with things in their normal life. You know, menopausal hot flashes and, and their knee that they injured in playing football and, and that now needs a knee replacement, right? They have to go on with their normal lives. So here are some people and some helpers that are not statistics. So this is the Cancer Catwalk, and it's just amazing. What a privilege to be there with these patients and their families and their kids and their parents, just celebrating having contained their cancer. But let's talk about a final C word, right? I want to talk about center, right? So we need to put patients at the center of all of this, right? We're dealing with this incredible information glut, right? Patients suddenly feel when they have a diagnosis in families that they need to become an expert on everything. There's information coming from all over the place, from the dark corners of the internet, from your Aunt Sally or your Uncle Bob or the barbershop. People feel they need to synthesize all this information, all the omics, right? This is what I would advise, and all my advice is imperfect, but when you're faced with a diagnosis, pick your team very carefully. Pick a multidisciplinary team, doctors that you trust that can talk to you in plain English that will answer your questions, and then be attentive, but you don't need to micromanage them, right? You pick them for their good outcomes, let them take care of you, and you concentrate on yourself, on your center, on what's important to you and the core of you. Finally, I want to talk about Charlie, with his permission. Charlie is, is a wildlife biologist. He and his wife, Cindy, had already done some thinking about what was at their center before he got his pancreatic diagnosis. So in 2011, they bought some property in Vermont and with some idea that eventually, someday, they were going to retire and have a farm there. He got a pancreatic tumor diagnosis in 2011, and he had all those steps that I'm telling you about, the terror, the Fall, everything falling away, thinking about what's important. And so then after his eventual successful treatment, 
he and his wife decided they were going to do what was at their center. They started their farm, and then at a post-op appointment, he told me that one of his uh, sheep was expecting. And I didn't know what he was going to say, but he said, well, you know, we're going to name the, 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 the baby sheep after you. <laughs> and at this point, I wasn't sure whether the sheep were for eating or for... for, for but in any case, he... he <laughs> So he said if it was a girl, they were going to name it Jenny, and if it was a boy, they were going to name it JT. So this is Jenny, and they did not eat her. He sends me pictures of Jenny's baby sheep, and then the grand sheep, and then the great-great-grand sheep, and, and, and Charlie, and Cindy, and um, their sheep, and Jenny's descendants, and their pigs, and their chickens, and their goats, and their bees are still in Vermont where they sell products from their farm, where they found their center. They play with their six grandchildren, two of whom were born after his pancreatic diagnosis. And they're now moving on to the next phase, like the normal stuff, where they are going to downsize the farm so they can travel more uh, in, in their retirement. So I, I just want to conclude with a plea that all of us, all of us that take care of patients, all of us, doctors, nurses, students, um, everyone, we need to keep the patients at the center, right? Stuff is so busy, there's so much information, there's so many statistics. Um, we need to remember that when we go into their rooms in the morning, on morning rounds, that if we don't have time to answer all the questions, we need to come back, right? There's a patient at the center of that. That's why we all went into medicine in the first place. So, thank you.